It is late Thursday, July 25th, and as we begin our most recent Tropical Storm Dorian video update, we're going to start with a look at the animated tropical cyclone forecast tracks from the Hurricane Center ever since advisories were initiated for Dorian, and you can see that the forecast philosophy has not changed all that much over the past couple of days. We have been expecting a general west-northwest motion, and this is what the Hurricane Center expects will continue as we go into early next week with a track just north of Puerto Rico and Hispaniola as we go on into the days Monday and Tuesday. Whenever a tropical storm is embedded within strong low to mid-level easterly flow beneath a very strong Atlantic subtropical ridge, the Hurricane Center has a good time forecasting these types of storms because the synoptic pattern does not change all that much. So usually if the storm just continues moving in a straight direction, the verification will be fairly good. The question with Dorian will be what happens beyond days 4 and 5 when it starts to round perhaps the western periphery of this ridge and steering currents begin to break down. Some model guidance is indicating that the troughing along the east coast will persist, while other models show that the ridging may build back towards the west into the east coast. The latest visible and standard infrared satellite animation reveals that Dorian perhaps looked a little bit better earlier this afternoon, and despite it beginning to move into slightly warmer water temperatures, we can see that the surface circulation appears to be slightly outrunning the mid-level circulation. If you look for some of the main low-level cloud elements, it appears to be outrunning some of the bigger convection that is located just to the east. And you can see where the strongest convection is located a little better on the enhanced infrared imagery. You can see it mainly displaced along the eastern semicircle of the circulation. And we have a new flare up trying to persist near the surface center. But again, it is moving quickly towards the west at roughly 18 to 20 miles per hour. So this is a little bit slower than where Chantal was moving. However, it's still moving at a fairly decent clip towards the west. And as is usually the case for tropical storms moving above 15 miles per hour, it is somewhat difficult for them to remain highly organized. Now as we take a look at the water vapor, as the surface circulation becomes slightly decoupled from the mid-level vortex, it also becomes a bit more susceptible to dry air entrainment. And you can see a lot of dry air does exist just to the west of the center of circulation. So although the vertical wind shear is moderately favorable for intensification, we still have a little bit of dry air along with some cool water temperatures along with the very quick movement of the tropical storm. So this is setting up a recipe for very little in the way of change in intensity over the next 24 to 48 hours. There is the chance that if dry air starts to entrain into the center of circulation, we could see a slight bit of weakening. However, that's probably not the most likely scenario, at least as of right now. Probably a steady state of intensification is going to be the main course over the short term. The latest microwave satellite pass also confirms the very slight decoupling between the surface circulation and the mid-level vortex. You can see that the surface center is still outrunning the convection with the mid-level vortex displaced a bit towards the east and towards the north. But overnight, we will have to see if another batch of convection can develop directly over the center. It is not uncommon for more convection to develop during the late overnight hours because this is when you normally see the greatest diurnal maximum of convection over the deep tropics. You still have relatively warm water near the surface compared to the cooling atmosphere aloft, so the contrast in temperature allows for more instability and more convection and thunderstorm development. As we observe the latest wind shear charts from the University of Wisconsin, you can see Tropical Storm Dorian beginning to make it into the extreme right-hand corner of the picture, and you can see that we have an upper-level ridge ventilating the cyclone quite nicely, and that is why we have dual outflow channels but there is some very weak westerly wind shear, as you can see those streamlines moving from west to east, and you can see that the values begin to increase as you approach the Lesser Antilles, with the shear increasing to 30 to 40 knots. And when you add the forward motion of Dorian at 15 to 20 miles per hour, you can start to figure out the reason why we do have a slight displacement between the surface vortex and the mid-level center. Now, will this shear begin to move out of the way? That's going to be the big question in terms of the intensity forecast. Really, the shear is dependent on the position of an upper-level low, and it is spinning just to the north of Puerto Rico quite nicely on this evening's water vapor animation. Some of the models show this upper-level low beginning to weaken and move a little bit more so towards the north, which could open up more in the way of upper-level ridging directly over Dorian as it starts to approach the Virgin Islands, but we will have to wait and see if that actually does occur. One fairly noticeable trend since last night's video has been a westward shift in the model guidance beyond day 4. This has been most noticeable in the latest two runs of the American GFS model. Both the 12Z and 18Z runs have suggested a more westerly track 
towards Hispaniola, and this is also going to be a major wild card in the intensity forecast. As you can see, as we go into days four and five, Dorian is expected to progress directly over the 10,000 foot mountain peaks. And by the time it starts to move into eastern Cuba, it is highly disrupted and it looks more so like a tropical wave than a well-defined tropical cyclone. What is even more important to look at compared to the actual track being shown in the models is the overall mid-level steering pattern. And you can see based on the latest mid-level steering forecast from the GFS that the trough over the east coast begins to lift out. And as we go into days 6, 7, and 8, we are left with nothing more than just a weakness between two ridges out across the southeast United States, including Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas. Off towards the east, you can still make out the Atlantic Subtropical Ridge. And out across the central United States, you have a secondary ridge over the central plains. So will this trough be enough to steer the tropical cyclone north of Hispaniola and then perhaps northward into the western Atlantic or the Carolinas? And to give you my best guesstimate, this trough does not look overly robust. It's fairly weak in the models, and unless it becomes more amplified in future guidance, I have a tough time believing that Dorian will start to recurve east of the Bahamas. Right now, it's looking like it could continue to trend westward, at least towards the Florida Peninsula, or perhaps even the Gulf of Mexico. Now, that's not to say interest in those areas will be dealing with a full-fledged tropical cyclone. As we've already talked about in the video, there are still several negative factors that Dorian must go against. First, it's the dry air. Second, it's the wind shear if the upper level low doesn't move out the way. And then third, it could pass directly over the greater Antilles unless it begins to gain more in the way of latitude beyond days three and four. For anyone doubting the possibility of a more westerly track, the last two operational runs of the GFS do have support from other model members. Beginning with the GFS ensembles, you can see that the 18Z run of the spaghetti ensemble show that the tracks have shifted significantly towards the west, with the vast majority showing a track well into the central Gulf of Mexico. And we now have only three outliers with a recurvature track between Bermuda and the Carolinas. Furthermore, we have growing support from the operational ECMWF model. What we are currently looking at is the low-level vorticity product, and you can really see the tropical cyclone fairly well out across the central Atlantic, but the ECMWF is still having some trouble grasping the full intensity of the storm. Right now it's still depicting nothing more than just a very organized area of low pressure. But nonetheless, the European is trending towards the west. Two days ago it was showing a medium range track towards the northwest towards Bermuda. Yesterday it was a little closer towards the northern Bahamas, and now as we can see today's 12Z run Beginning with the day four forecast, the greatest vorticity is expected to be just north of San Juan, Puerto Rico. And the more noticeable difference between the European runs begins to show up by day five. You can see that it's moving into the extreme southeast Bahamas versus moving a little bit more so towards the north. And then as we go into day six and day seven, the strongest vorticity max associated with this system is spreading through the Florida Keys and the southeast Gulf of Mexico. Again, this is by day seven, so next Thursday. As we talked about with the most recent run of the GFS, the same can be said with the most recent run of the European. In terms of the 500 mil level steering flow pattern, we are seeing a trend towards a weaker trough in the model as we go into 120 hours or day five. Already you start to notice that the trough is lifting out of the Ohio Valley and just to the south of the troughing we see a reemergence of western Atlantic ridging and any ridge over the western Atlantic is gonna have the tendency to push anything immediately to its south more so towards the west into Florida or the Gulf. By 144 hours, again, the European is still struggling to pick up Dorian, and Dorian could also be struggling as it moves across the greater Antilles, but nonetheless, the European is showing a very broad area of low pressure in the form more so of a tropical wave passing over Cuba by this point. And then finally into day seven, we still see the broad connection of the two ridges, the one out across the central Atlantic and the other one over the central plains. So this could still enforce more of a westerly path into the central or eastern Gulf. The third forecast model of interest is the Canadian CMC model. And while it is not a very accurate model in the tropics, it is always good to compare what it is showing compared to what we see with the GFS and the European. And one thing that is similar to the European right off the bat is that the Canadian model is failing to fully resolve the true intensity of the tropical cyclone. Initially, it looks like nothing more than a tropical wave out there across the central Atlantic. And then it only modestly intensifies the storm over the next six days, which is somewhat interesting to note 
because the CMC often has too much of an aggressive bias with intensification, but we do see fairly good track agreement amongst all three models through day seven, with the Canadian showing a strong area of low pressure moving into the southern Florida area towards Key West and the southeast Gulf of Mexico as we go into the middle half of next week. So for the time being, we are favoring a track near or maybe just to the south of the official forecast somewhere out across eastern Cuba as we go into days five and six. And the intensity forecast is highly up in the air that far out, mainly because we simply don't know how much interaction there will be between the storm and the Greater Antilles, along with that upper level low that we're monitoring on water vapor imagery. There are indications that if it can bypass the upper level low, then conditions could start to become more favorable if it gets close to South Florida. But again, major question marks are in the air with regards to that. And you are just going to have to stay tuned and watch the tropics every day, as is going to be the case as we get closer to the peak of the season. It looks like it's only going to get more active from here on out. So please stay tuned to 28storms.com along with, of course, the Hurricane Center for more updates.